I move that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this board. Meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak and any conflicting with the governor's executive order permitting electronic meetings be suspended. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, Ms. Bessington, um, I have to go through a roll call. Um, Ms. Franklin? Aye. Yes. Aye. Uh, Mr. Frederick? Aye. See Dr. Smith on here? Aye. And Dr. Campbell, are you here? I don't see you. All right, and I also am voting aye. Thank you, motion carried. All right, uh, con consideration of extension of public health emergency. Currently, um, the public health emergency is, um, is um, expected to expire at the end of March. Um, as we've, go we've gone through this process more and more, um, one of the areas um, that, that I think um, the public health emergency will, um, having a time for public health emergency makes sense is as our, um, as conventions are being booked, as, um, as things are, are being planned for our city, um, if there's no public health emergency declaration, the, um, our public health team cannot review applications. This causes a challenge for um, our convention um, individuals because they're going through the process. They've been really great stewards of, of following rules. But unfortunately, they can't submit an application for an event three months out because it, it not, doesn't fall. So literally, if our order expired March, January 31st, and we don't, and they get an application for February 1, the public health team today could not ever do that. So with that said, um, after discussing it with, with some of my colleagues, um, you know, from here in health as well as some of the visitor center um, individuals, um, as well as just in general, I would like to actually kind of motion to extend it by one month to the end of April. So right now the public health emergency goes until March 31st. And then probably roll this every month. We then give about a three month lead time, not only for what I just described that will help our community and our businesses, but also it still continues us to evaluate what is going on with COVID, uh, the mask mandate, all the other orders we're doing. And of course, as always, this could be, um, this could be re you know, pulled back at any time. So with that said, I, I guess I, I will make a motion to extend the public emergency till um, the last day of April, the one month beyond where it is currently, and we can re-examine it again next month. Go from there. That's my statement. That's, that's why I have any dialogue around around that. So you look for a second. I guess I, I should have made the motion. Yeah, I was going to move to extend it until April. Thank you. Uh, question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is that enough time? I mean, if, if we're talking about conventions being booked, mm -hmm. planning, yeah. and I'm just trying to anticipate. Yeah, so it, it looks like is that enough time for planning? Because we can always change it later. Yeah, you know, um, I think um, that was a concern of mine. Um, I think right now the biggest meetings and stuff are extended until about the end of June. Um, I think in the short term, um, let's go into the end of April with the understanding that perhaps once we explore this a little further over the next month, um, then maybe it would make more sense to extend it beyond three months. But right now, um, Tom Sharp and his team, um, people from the Convention Visitor Center, um, others, um, I, I think maybe worthwhile kind of seeing how this goes and then running some, um, maybe having some discussions um, with some of our colleagues at the state to understand why we're extending it and that it's not just because we want to extend a public health emergency for the sake of it. But, so I, I think my inclination is it would be better to extend it further than the three months, but I think for now, let's. With my, my suggestion would be to stay with three months and then see how things So do you think other than what um, today just brought up, are there any other downsides to that that we can think of? To extending it to? To, to go into April 30th, are there any? I, I don't think, it, I, I don't think there, there is. And honestly, I, I would, I like, I mean, at the end of June would, would make sense too. But again, I think there's some, there's been some discussion not in this room, but, but you know, from a from a broader state, state standpoint, that 
public health boards are, are extending their rates, and this is really all. I think what we're trying to do is something that gives our our um, business community some some clear understanding of the rules and allows health to partner with them with three months leeway or beyond. So I think there there really isn't anything negative to extend it by one month. Yeah. See how this month goes. Uh, we can have more discussion to see if this helps our um, visitors, and our our conventions, our hotels, um, and then next week if everyone's to take it, it extends it further, we'll extend it further. So let me ask you a question. What happens if conventions are booking in May and June without the public health order in place, and we find later on that we need to extend to those months? How does how how does that uh, it, how does that interfere with their plans? Well, it, 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 it's a, it's such a great question that we've spent about uh, a little while now. Uh, we just meeting in the uh, 30, 40 minutes talking about the cha it's, the challenge, it's challenging for them, right? It's challenging for our, our, our very, um, our good, you know, our business, our hotels and so forth are trying to be good stewards of the public health rule um, and that our team cannot approve anything beyond the public health emergency order date. Um, they could make, they being the hotels can make assumptions of what may be approved, but they don't know that with certain days because, you know, the situation can vary. The situation can continue to vary. Um, but it just, I mean, there's no public health emergency after whatever date we extend it to. So right now, they, they can just book. They can book with, you know, with, as you point out, it very well could be in the, you know, they, they would have to amend what they do. Um, okay. But I think having, I think everyone would agree that having more clear guidelines helps um, public health, helps um, um, businesses, um, and I, that's what, I, what I'm trying to do. With, um, again, I do it until the end of June may make, make a lot of sense. I just um, worry it may, may trigger some, some uh, it misinformed, um, it may be misinforming to people, but we may need to just do a little more. So. I'll second it. Is there no more discussion? Okay. Um, so there's a motion to take the extension to the end of April. Um, is there any more discussion? Dr. Harris, or Dr. Smith, excuse me, I'm looking at, at you there. All right. No, no, I'm ready to vote on it. All right. Any more? Be good. All right. With that said, I'll, I'll vote to extend the public health emergency until the end of April. Um, Dr. Smith? Aye. 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 Well, thank you. This motion carries. Um, all right. There are minutes from December 10th and December 11th um, from meetings that we had. Any discussion around those and or motions to approve? Motions to approve meetings from December 10th and 11th. All right. Seconded. Dr. Dr. Smith. Um, seconded. All right, any discussion? All right, Dr. Smith, we'll start the roll call with you. Aye. Ms. Franklin. Aye. 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 And aye. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, air pollution yep. permit, Mr. Fingy, I see you on here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is John Finke. I'm the director of the Air Pollution Control Division. The next, the next item on your agenda is to set the air pollution permit fees for 2020. Uh, this is something that we come to the board for each year, so this will sound very familiar to some of you. Our regulations set a presumptive fee that grows each year with the consumer price index. This fee is based on the allowable emissions that appear on a company's permit. This year, that presumptive fee would be just under $54 per ton of regulated pollutants. However, our regulations also state that the agency shouldn't collect more funds than are necessary to operate the program. So at the beginning of a calendar year, we work with finance to establish a budget and determine how much revenue we need to generate by the end of that year. Since facilities can start up, shut down, or change size throughout the year, we wait and invoice them at the end of the year. This allows us to accurately set the permit fee to collect the necessary amount. This year, we've identified a permit fee of $28 per ton, same as last year. Uh, this is where the board comes in. 
Uh, each year, we come to you and request a variance from the provisions of Section 105680, which establishes that higher permit fee. So at this time, I am requesting or recommending to the board that they grant a one-year variance from the provisions of Section 105680 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by establishing an annual permit fee of $28 per ton. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, I, oh, Mr. Mayor, yes, sir. I, I certainly know that we don't want to see what we're going to be spending on this, and I'm fine with $20, if that's what it is. But I do wonder, are there things we could be doing to expand the program and perhaps do more good if we did raise the fee in future years? Um, <laughs> So there is room to raise the fees. Um, we work on a combination of local dollars and federal grant funding. Now our federal grant funds have been at level funding for over a decade. Um, so we try to be very careful and very lean on how we approach uh, this fee because once we get up to the presumptive fee, there's no growing after that. So we've tried to be very careful and very stewardly with our resources. Thank you. Uh, it does. I, I understand the, the reasoning there. I'm just I'm looking at this and thinking that perhaps part of the logic behind this annual increase is that this is intended to be a discouragement to producing these pollutants. And are we really doing that? I don't know if we're leaving it flat every single year. It seems to me that over time, we might look at what more could we do if we had more money in charge. Well, so let, let, let me elaborate. Um, Sorry. We, we see a need for raising the fee down the road just to maintain what we're doing. Um, the, the day is coming where those fees will, with, with the level of federal funding that we've had, those fees are going to have to come up just to maintain the level of services that we currently offer. And so my concern has been that by raising the fees to bring on elective programs, there will come a point where we have to then discontinue those programs to continue providing our core services. Okay. Any other? I think I moved to approve last year and said, I really struggled to understand this in an in-depth way, but John, I trust you implicitly and I do I do get the basic rationale you put forward, so I do, I do. All right, so there's a motion for proof. There's a second. Second. All right, Ms. Franklin, any other discussion? All right, Dr. Smith. Aye. Ms. Franklin. Aye. Ms. Aye. Mr. Frederick. Aye. And I also approve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Allen Raw, one of my favorite programs to talk about. Although uh, we have a lot of great programs, but one can see the screen. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you again for yielding time on your uh, agenda to hear an update about our federal Healthy Start project, Nashville Strong Babies. Um, I do have to say it is rather a, a timely presentation as we are headed into uh, MLK Day weekend. And I am uh, reminded, I think as all of us are, um, of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his legacy, and in particular what stands out to me today uh, is one of his many quotes that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about Nashville Strong Babies. Um, I can't say enough, first of all, about the team of public health professionals that I have the most honored privilege to work with on a daily basis. Our maternal child and adolescent health division, you can see here, made up of 21 uh, public health professionals, I manage a $7 million portfolio of programs and Nashville Strong Babies is one of the newest one that we get to add to this list, um, particularly the staff, uh, Ms. Williams, Ms. Bofo, uh, Ms. Jean Jumeau, Ms. Garvey, Ms. Witt, and our other team members, Mr. Benici and Ms. Bradbury are absolutely excellent 
every day. They are showing up, they're providing services to families and haven't stopped in the middle of a pandemic like most of our programs have. So I am extremely grateful to them. When we think about infant mortality, and for some, this may be the first time you're hearing this information, and for others, you've heard me say this a lot, but we really think about infant mortality as a community mirror that reflects our collective capacity to promote and protect the health and well being of our very youngest and most vulnerable. So, what does Nashville's reflection look like? Well, in a sense, we all lose when we're looking in the mirror. Despite a 42.9% decline in sleep-related infant deaths, and we have worked very diligently, and by we, I mean not just our health department programs, but partners all over the city and at the state level, we still have about 20% of our sleep-related infant deaths uh, that make up all of our infant deaths, and affordable housing is still a driver. Um, you may recall that uh, I came and I presented for, uh, before the board in early 2016, and we talked about the role of affordable housing contributing to sleep-related infant deaths, and it is still a role today. We still lose about three kindergarten classes of babies every year, and there has been relatively little change in this infant mortality rate overall since 2013. In the most recent March of Dimes 2020, 2020 Prematurity Report Card, uh, Nashville, Davidson County, we got a D plus. Um, and we got a D plus because one out of 10 babies born in our city is born too early, it's born premature. And we've had no change in our prematurity rate since 2014. And what's really troublesome about that is typically when we are reviewing infant deaths, um, particularly infant deaths that we say may not be preventable, congenital anomalies has always been the leading cause of death. But prematurity on average between 2016 and 2018 is outpacing congenital anomalies. Now, you may say, okay, Deanna, this is Nashville, so what do we look like in comparison to the rest of the United States? Well, if we think about the infant mortality rate in the U.S. from two, from 1980 to 2016, we see that there's been an overall 53% improvement in the infant mortality rate. And this is largely due to um, advances in medicine, prenatal care, better maternity care, better NICU care for low birth weight babies and premature babies. But when we really start to separate the data and we understand what's happening when you look at um, our infant mortality by race, there's been a 47% improvement for African-American families, which is that line at the top, and a 56% improvement for Caucasian families, which is the red line at the bottom. But what we really pay attention to in public health is the idea of the disparity ratio that in 1980, the infant mortality rate was two times as worse for African-Americans in the United States than it was for Caucasians. And by the time we get to 2016, the disparity ratio has gotten larger. It's now closer to two and a half times. And if that wouldn't be as troubling as it is that the rate in 2016 for African-Americans is actually going up across the U.S. We typically look at this and in, in our public health field, we really understand that it's not that somehow people's health behaviors have gotten worse over time despite these improvements, but you still are seeing the intergenerational and the lasting and current effects of race-based policy in medicine and healthcare and in all the fields. Um, Nashville looks similar to the United States, only a lot worse when you start to segment out our infant mortality by race. From 1995 to 2018, our disparity ratio was about 1.8 1 times higher. By the time we get to 2018, that ratio has almost tripled in its size. Um, we've seen a 30% improvement in the Caucasian infant mortality rate from 1995 to 2018 and a 12% improvement in African-American infant mortality rate. And those improvements stopped in 2013. So if we're taking a look at 2018 as a year in and of itself and compared to where we were in 1995, African-American families with children in Davidson County are worse off today than they were in 1995. And the improvements that we made 
we've lost, we have a net loss of 20% of those improvements today. So if we think about it in another way, the last year that the Caucasian infant mortality rate was comparable to the African American infant mortality rate, that was in the year 2000, right? And that's uh, seven, uh, a rate about seven per 1,000 versus nine per, nine per 1,000. The idea is that this suggests that there's a 13 year survival lag that African American infants don't have in comparison to Caucasian infants. And again, if this pattern were, were to persist and not steadily increase as we've seen since really 2014, it would suggest that African American infants in Davidson County would have to wait until the year 2032, another 13 years into the future from today, to get to, right, have the same opportunity to celebrate their first birthday as Caucasian babies had in 2000. Again, I go back in reflection to this idea that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We understand that to eliminate the disparity, we have to improve the African-American infant mortality rate at a faster pace than the Caucasian infant mortality rate. And because we're public health, we can't compromise the Caucasian infant mortality rate. And I would submit to you, and as our community says to us and our customers say to us, that to eliminate this inequity that's really caused by racism and systemic racism, we have to change our mental models of how we approach what we do. We have to create new conditions and not just new programs. And we have to replace this deleterious race-based policies and practices. Now, the thought of striving to improve the rate of survival for one group at a faster pace than for another group bothers many people. They complained that doing so would be immoral, unfair, and unjust. Yet we, public health, medicine, law, education, housing, transportation, justice, you get it. We have been doing this for decades and we have behaved as if this is normal. We have invested resources into improving the rate of one group over another. And we say we have to come to a full stop. Our actions have to match our words when it's related to equity, specifically racial equity. We have to demand differently of ourselves within our institutions as colleagues and of each other, as well as the institutions with which we partner. We have to dedicate resources, time, effort, and funds to closing the gap while maintaining the gains that we have. And we have to be held accountable to our customers, our clients, and our community. So fast forward, we spent many, many hours in grant writing mode in November of 2018 to compare a competitive application um, to HRSA to help us um, fund a federal Healthy Start project here. Historically, federal Healthy Start projects, um, cities that have a Healthy Start project have a much better infant mortality rate than places that do not. We knew that we had an opportunity to bring new resources to Nashville to get those resources directly into the communities that had the greatest need. And not just a little bit of resources, a significant amount of resources to help us try to come to this full stop and change course. Specifically, this is a map of our Nashville Strong Family Zone. These are the seven zip code areas in Davidson County that have had the highest infant mortality rates, and particularly that disparity around African American infant mortality. And we affectionately identify this as an opportunity zone for, for public health to not only invest in resources and programming, but also, also to really invest in innovation. We see Nashville Strong Babies in our Federal Healthy Start Project as an equity innovation lab. We adopt a social ecological framework to support birthing people, and you're gonna hear me use that language throughout the remaining part of this presentation, that we consider both practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice, because there's a place for both. And if you wanna learn more about the campaign that we launched in July, uh, you can visit our website at nashvillestrongbabies.org. But specifically, when we focus on innovation, I have to give a shout out to um, our partners at Meharry Medical College, particularly the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Department of Pediatrics, because they are supporting us in implementing group prenatal care. There's benefits for all pregnant women. There's lots of research that has been documented and demonstrates the benefits of group prenatal care, but especially for African-American women. We're doing something new. We're establishing group pediatric care. 
This is new, not as well established, but the idea behind group prenatal care, we're taking that to now group pediatric care so that you have a group of women that are all due around the same due date who are pregnant. They're deliver their babies and then they're gonna bring their babies in for their well child visits. You build a village and a community and it gives us an opportunity to address and support whole neighborhoods at a time. Um, shout out to our partners at the New Life Center because this is where the support for partners and fathers come in, particularly around parenting and relationship building, and particularly during this pandemic, trying to help men find employment when they have been laid off from you know their company, et cetera, as businesses have closed. They've been really instrumental in supporting us. Um, I also have to say for a uh, preferred partner at Homeland Heart Birth and Wellness Collective, it's a local 501c3 that um, approached us about providing free doula services for up to 50 families who were enrolled in Nashville Strong Babies. This is the prenatal care through labor and delivery in six months postpartum. There's not another doula service that I'm aware of in Nashville that will follow a woman up to six months postpartum. And they also offer complimentary lactation support service. When we pulled our community transformation network together, which is our advisory group that really does support um, not just Nashville Strong Babies, but maternal and child health all over this city, um, we had our first gathering in August of last year, August of 2019, sorry, we're out of 2020. Uh, but we were talking about, we'd enrolled our first clients in July. And so we were talking about really needing support around breastfeeding that uh, women are not able to get all of the supplies that they need in a timely manner to really support their breastfeeding initiation. Well, we developed a relationship with our partners at Surge Prep. A shout out to Alfonso Harvey and his team. It's a medical supply company, but particular partnering with us to provide breast pumps and supplies and compression hoses and other perinatal support for women as soon as they find out they're pregnant. Most of the time, um, women may not get a breast pump until after they delivered or shortly you know, into their third trimester of pregnancy but they're supporting our breastfeeding efforts tremendously. You may also recall uh, we entered into a relationship uh, in the formal mayoral administration, the Briley administration, with uh, prioritizing enrolled families um, and, and reorganizing the use of the Barnes funds that um, you know, a developer applying for Barnes funds would receive priority points on their application if they were willing to build family housing for NSB participants. I'm happy to say Be A Helping Hand was awarded those Barnes funds. Uh, I have seen some of the blueprints for the community that they are building. We have focused a lot on advocating for family housing and an affordable housing. They are building three and four bedroom footprint houses for families and this is significant. Um, certainly the you know breaking ground and getting started and using these Barnes funds was delayed because of the pandemic, but the, the hope is that we'll be able to see the fruits of some of these first houses in the spring of this year. We focus with our community transformation network on really uh, addressing housing as the number one social determinant issue that's facing our families working with institutions so that they're providing services that are culturally responsive and unbiased, and really creating this network that will benefit everyone in Nashville. So very quickly, how do we do? So if you flash back to May of 2019, we were together at Napier Sudicum neighborhood. We were celebrating this press announcement. We were hiring staff and we were getting to work. I know I'm short on time, but let me just share with you very briefly some of our successes. From a care management standpoint, we have an outstanding team of care managers. These are trained home visitors in perinatal case management. Again, this is an example around breastfeeding. That in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we are all but shut down in providing services from March until the end of June. We decided to uh, accept new clients beginning in July with the hopes that um, families would understand that we were still here providing services and we were going to provide services in a way that was safe for everybody. We really focused on uh, a really focused on breastfeeding. It's what it's a key indicator in maternal health and in infant health. Here's a, just a list of some of the examples of what our care managers are doing in terms of educating women about breastfeeding, connecting them to surge prep. Again, this is very early in mom's pregnancy, making that referral to Homeland Heart for doula support, connecting them to WIC, 
encouraging them and celebrating them and making sure that they have a usual source of medical care. Well, as an example, we set a goal that 50% uh, of our enrolled clients would be breastfeeding um, by October 31st. And we use that, that's the end of the federal fiscal year that we're accountable to HRSA for. Well, actually 83.3% of our clients were breastfeeding their babies by the end. If we look at our indifference group, uh, the average breastfeeding rate for African-American women in Davidson County is 76% and just African-American women participating in Nashville Strong Babies in the last calendar year breastfeeding rates are 79.6%. If you compare NSV to Tennessee and to Davidson County, um, the year's worth of the data are not a one-to-one, -one, but overall breastfeeding in Tennessee is 75.8%. Again, NSV in 2020 is 83.3%, and Davidson County in 2016 data, which is the most recently available data we have, is 91%. We can demonstrate in terms of equity, an indifference group of 3.4% increase in breastfeeding above our average African-American breastfeeding in Davidson County. And we are approaching uh, within you know, less than a 10% difference of closing this gap between um, the disparity of African-American breastfeeding and breastfeeding overall in Davidson County. I'm gonna pause for just a second because this top question, if nothing stood in your way, what would you do? I think is a pretty powerful question. And I very recently learned um, to ask this question and just close my eyes and just dream. If nothing stood in your way, what would you do? Well, if it were me, I would make sure that we've adopted universal home visiting as a practice in Nashville, Davidson County not just for the benefit of Nashville Strong Babies, but for the benefit of every single pregnant and expectant family in Nashville, Davidson County. At the health department, we have already adopted an opt out process um, in our clinics. And thank you to, um, to Laura in particular for helping us with family planning in the sexual health clinic and to Dr. Fonda Harris for supporting this with presumptive eligibility. Wouldn't it be great um, if we looked at home visiting, not just as a risk-based need program, but it's really a health benefit that we offer to everyone. And it's a benefit that you let people know that they're eligible for and that they could receive and that they have the choice to then say no to. Um, I would also onboard at least three more OB providers. Our OB providers at Meharry are fantastic, and I want more OB providers who are willing to adopt a universal referral approach like Meharry has, where 100% of the clients that they serve in their practice, they're going to make sure that their clients know that these services are available to them. The other thing I would do is I would take a page from the Magnolia Mother's Trust Project in Jackson, Mississippi. Don't have a lot of time left to explain, but I would encourage you to uh, see this TED Talk from uh, TEDx Jackson 2019. It's the idea of universal basic income with no strings attached as a way of honoring people's dignity. Um, this team with Nashville Strong Babies and all the partners that we have in place and the many more partnerships that we are going to develop, they're making a difference and in a relatively short amount of time. The one issue that we just don't have the resources alone with our federal funding, this is $5.4 million, but that's not enough to effectively pay for housing and ensure that every family in Davidson County has a safe, stable, and affordable place to live. We need more housing providers like Be A Helping Hand building family housing, least three and four bedroom type footprint. And we really need board support in leveraging and advocating for more housing in Nashville. Lastly, changing the narrative about infant mortality to infant vitality. Again, you probably have heard me say this before, but infant vitality is our community North Star. And this demonstrates our collective capacity to promote and protect the health and well being of our very youngest and most vulnerable through equity. Infant vitality is multifactorial, it is high quality healthcare and public health, it is safe and stable, affordable housing. It is a healthy psychological and physical environment. It is equitable wealth building opportunities. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And whatever affects one directly 
infects all of us indirectly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, <laughs> such a, it's such a dense, dense, dense meet, uh, presentation with so much great information. Um, I welcome for discussion, questions, input. I would, I would like to know, uh, Diana, that was really, really very important and very special to hear all that, even though I've had the opportunity to hear you before, and each year it, it kind of catches my breath. <laughs> We've still got these kind of statistics. Um, and I like the way you ended it. I guess my question is, if you could address various groups that might, in your opinion, have an impact on this, what group in the city or the community? Would it be medical groups like physicians, uh, nurses, et cetera, who need to be more educated perhaps on the disparities that exist? Would it be uh, council people who need to hear across the board? I mean, if you can help us know who do you want to act the Rotary Club? Is it, uh, and, and I don't mean in a hollow sort of way. I mean, really to try and educate them and get, get it on a radar screen that probably it isn't on. Um, the short answer is, is all. Uh, that's not the short answer that you wanted because, you know, it, being able to, to, you know, kind of call down a list. Uh, housing is still the number one social determinant that families face in Nashville. We can provide excellent, excellent programs and services, and we do all over the health department. But when it comes to trying to help somebody find housing, it's the number one issue that every program that's in a direct service role runs into. Um, and if I'm speaking out of, out of turn, if there's another issue other than perhaps the opioid crisis, um, I will stand corrected. But when I talk to my colleagues around the department, you're trying to help somebody, housing is, housing is it. Um, I would love to see us again take advantage of the opportunity to use Barnes funds to prioritize people that have small children. Uh, it's an ACE issue when we're talking about housing. It's a violence issue when we're talking about housing. It's a COVID issue when you're talking about infectious disease control. It's it's all of those things, right? Um, I was dreaming last night, and I know I'm speaking way out of turn, and uh, Tino and Dr. Wright will let me know this um, later on, but I was dreaming about our, our Healthy Start budget last night, and I know, you know, we paid, uh, you know, about 23.54% um, of our grant dollars in, in indirect, and I just had this wild dream of, well, what if we could take a portion of that indirect and apply it to an affordable housing fund or to a universal basic income fund? I don't know how that works. I was dreaming, you know, but if nothing stood in my way, I would dream big and I would do it. And I want to encourage you all. I know that we have to transition on the agenda, but I want to encourage you when you're thinking about what you can do as a board, if nothing stood in your way, what would you do? And come back and tell okay, us. Thank you to all these <laughs> I just want to follow up on a little bit in, in the direction of Carol. First, thank you very much for the hard work you guys do. And I know that uh, we're all diligently working. Uh, uh, I, I wonder how we could position ourselves as a board of health to perhaps make this issue more prominent if it really is housing because a couple of things that stood out today, your last statement, uh, some of the effects that the health and of the babies for the health that's the barometer, number one. Secondarily, uh, the fact that Nashville started this at what was approximately now the national average of 11 point something percentage death, and we're now up at 13 point something. So something has gone wrong here. My guess is it probably is people being uh, pushed out of housing. Uh, because of the affordability issues. I wonder what we look at other cities, I don't know if it's us, I'm not sure what their minority makeup is, but some other cities that might be similar, have they been able to do something that might have made a difference there? And if it boils down that it is housing, and that this really is something that permeates everything we see in public health, are we really making, allow, putting a loud platform out there? Are we getting 
are we making a big enough noise about this? My guess is we're not because I haven't. Yeah. This is really kind of a rhetorical question. It's not really much to do about it. So, so uh, thank you, Dion. And I recognize what you're saying with regards to housing being the uh, being the the issue or the social determinant of health that is conserved across several different health outcomes. And so my question to you is, or, or maybe it's just a questioning out loud is, does that then become part of our strategy? So how, how do we, how do we infuse housing overall in our public health strategy? And is, is that something that's being considered as we think about the new strategic plan? That fits very well with the same question I'm trying to get yeah. to, is are we really prioritizing it? Right. So, so, so lowest common denominator seems to be housing, and it could be something else. And so what would I do um, differently or, or I would, I, would, I would try to make sure that we can prioritize housing or any other social determinant of health that's going to be conserved across so many different outcomes and initiatives in the department. So then it doesn't become a program, it becomes a systems issue, right, that we are touching. And of course, we're collaborating um, with our other metro agencies. But I think, for me, that's my takeaway from the conversation today. So thank you. All right. Can I just one more, and then we're going to move on as much as I'd love to take off, please. OK, one is um, just a yes or a no, sort of, have you all addressed this in Healthy Leadership Nashville? I mean, well, not that. I mean, Healthy Nashville, the committee, Healthy Nashville. Has it come up? I, mean, I, you, I, I understood you to ask, um, has this information been shared with the Healthy Nashville Leadership Council? Is that the question? Right. Um, not, not formally, no. Um, pandemic happened so <laughs> we haven't really gotten outside of the out of the house very much so to speak oh, other yeah. than with, uh, other than with our partners um happy happy to uh i think the the more that in a in a big picture in public health the more that we are focused on um create changing and creating new conditions for people the better impact we're going to have on people's overall health i think we we basically understand that and um, i i don't think that we fully understand the scope of the impact of housing because we're still in this pandemic and um it, i can share anecdotes obviously don't have the time to do so but that would be it for me. Okay. So the last thing before Alex slaps me um, <laughs> is we noticed on the personnel um, list, and you may not be on the call by then, so I just want to say and ask that you tell Treva how much we have appreciated her and how much we would really love to see her face sometime when there is no COVID, so we can tell her that in person. Thank you very much for her service, is what I'd like to, to have you relate to her. I will do. Okay. And I, I'm grateful for that. I really, this is a, uh, thank you for that. And um, know that this board will support you in any way that you need it. Please reach out. All right. Thank you. Um, truly my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Lester to discuss uh, the organizational chart. Ms. Lester. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have the uh, org chart in your packet, and um, I just have a few comments about it. Uh, it was the org chart that was approved um, by the board in December of 2019. And Dr. Wright and I came in after we were appointed and we took the org chart and divided it 
between the two of us so that each area would have um, a director to report to. Um, the only, there's a small change. Um, there are some people that, or there was a group that was under the deputy director and we don't have the deputy director over that group. So that group is reporting um, to me and they are um, currently working on the strategic plan and trying to finish up the accreditation, um, um, the, the uh, process that we need to send who finish um, the process. Um, so those are the major changes. Um, we wanted to see if we could, It's a, we call it a working org chart because we're still in strategic plan and there may be a few more things that we want to tweak. So we didn't know whether it needed to be voted on at this point or if we could just kind of carry on until after the strategic plan is finished and then we would have a chart for you. So that's our question, I guess. Just to answer that question, Ms. Lester, I, I think my understanding is that this has been approved previously. Um, a, a formal board vote doesn't necessarily need to happen, but with that said, I, I do think um, I, I want to give all my colleagues an opportunity to have a discussion. And then the other part, if I, if I may just ask, um, the Health Equity Innovation Bureau, um, you and I had spoken about, um, I don't know if this is when you were going to talk about how that was a hiring for that process, and also, um, is this one that has the line that goes to both both worlds? And that's, I, I don't know if that if I'm speaking out of turn because I know you and I talked about right, that yeah. the board, but I, I, I just wanted to make sure that was brought up. Well, we put it as a placeholder because we've had some discussion about trying to figure out what programs in the department would fit under that particular bureau, or whether it should be in a, an executive level position with a few people to report to them. So we're still in the midst of that. I've sent out some emails to all the ELT. I've gotten lots of different feedback and we haven't come to any real decision at that point. So right now we just have it as a placeholder. It has been approved by downtown HR to go ahead and release the freeze on it so it can be posted. But we wanna make sure that we are posting it for the right um, position. So it's still kind of in a holding pattern and it will be under the administrative side for, for now. Um, that's where we are. Question from my yes. I just, and I will not pretend to be an expert in the public health world, but I, I think I have a bias that, that this would be a, a position and a function that would cut across the entire organization because uh, health equity is an issue across the board. So I don't know how that fits into your thinking. The right. Well, the administrative side does pretty much cross the, the whole department. You, you'll see finance right. Right. and administration okay. under that under that side as well. The only thing I'm that referring more to the way you phrased it earlier when you talked about you were unsure of you whether you wanted to be an executive level position with people whose responsibility is health equity or whether you wanted departments to report to them and program to them. And I guess or whether you want the bureau director, correct? Yeah. So thank you. Wait. We may be a little bit more clear on the next meeting. I think we're still okay. kind of working on it. It is important and it is in the forefront for us. So my question is uh, for the Health Equity and Innovation Bureau, uh, we had talked about, I guess I would like tomorrow, maybe if not now, later, um, why include innovation? I know before it's been I forgot what it was before, but when we talked about it, we talked about racial and health equity. I'd just like to learn more about the thinking around innovation. And as you're assessing where this lives, what this looks like, is that part of the strategic planning process? So understanding yes. that maybe you'll come to better clarity as you move this through the strategic planning process. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Innovation got thrown in there. It was just health equity, and I think it was racial and health equity. And as one of the suggestions was innovation, um, and I put it there trying to figure out what we could do with it. But yeah, we're still in the strategic planning process, and I think it will become more clear once we decide on some of the um, objectives that we're looking at. Okay. It would make a lot of sense to me to let them go on with the strategic plan and not take a formal vote until 
you know, it's all. That's not, yeah, I would I would agree. That, oh, no voters need this point. This this, this outline has been previously approved in 2019, and I appreciate the effort that both Dr. Wright and Ms. Lester put in to really making sure no area is not is um, overlooked, and that there's clear clear lines of um, authority. So thank you. Any other questions around? Yes, I appreciate you bringing this up, Ms. Lester. Uh, and I want to ask today, I kind of looked at that and I thought that's new, but given the presentation just previously, the whole issue of housing and us being much more um, into understanding that impact on infant mortality and so many other things, that to me is sort of innovative. Uh, you know, it's not in the public health world. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it could be, but it's social determinants of health and systems and structural uh, racism. We, we've had that. So going as far upstream as possible yeah. makes sense. And so in the public health world, it's housing, economic opportunity, education, those aren't necessarily foreign or right. innovative. <laughs> per se. I think what might be innovative is how the city works together to address that. I guess it's, yeah. But these conversations are long standing. They're long standing. I get that. I do. I just I just think there's something nice about um, even though they were innovative some years ago, putting some teeth and action into it yeah. in a different kind of way is a is is innovative to me. Yeah. But anyway. But, I mean, there's not strategic planning going on, so I'm, yeah. and I'm excited to hear about where that plan is. Okay. Um, grant and application. Can I turn it over to you for a second? Um, yeah. Both Dr. Campbell and, and Ms. Theron for, for the book. So, Mr. Diamond, and I'll be right back. Thank you. 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 Uh, and they were all in your uh, initial packet. Uh, there were no addition, no late additions. So, uh, the first one is a, a amendment number two to our immunization services grant uh, from the state. Um, that adds funding. It's for COVID-related activities. It adds uh, strike teams and translation services for our COVID effort. Um, item number two is uh, a small, uh, as amendment three, which adds a small amount of funding to our Healthy Start a home visiting grant from the state. And uh, item number three is uh, the FDA Southeast Regional Seminar Grant for $2,000. And that's a grant that we get uh, every year it's, uh, for, for training. So uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions anyone has. If not, I would ask for a motion to approve. Move to approve um, the grant and contract uh, listed. All right. The motion. Seconded. Second. Any other discussion? All right. Ms. Franklin. Aye. Ms. Essington. Oh, aye. <laughs> Mr. Frederick. Aye. Dr. Campbell. Aye. And Dr. Smith. Aye. And aye. So, thank you. Just one quick question before we leave this topic. I yes. noticed that for the past couple of months we haven't. Is this a, just this a slow grant application? Yes. We've not had any grant applications coming up. And it one makes me wonder is the pipeline. Well, our, our pipeline is, is pretty full with COVID right now. So adding any any new programs or activities, um, you know, with existing staff is, is definitely a non-starter. Um, and adding, again, adding new programs with new staff presents its own challenges. So, um, you know, our staff are, are constantly looking for opportunities, but uh, there just haven't been many out there that, that make sense for the department, but especially with uh, how thinly we're stretched. Uh, trying to maintain current operations while also, uh, you know, in the COVID world here. Okay. Um, report of interim directors, Ms. Lester and Dr. Wright. Um, turn it over to you all, please. Good morning, or good evening. I'm still on morning, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off. I wanted to just talk a little bit about COVID and, and vaccine and all of that, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Tina. Um, so first thing to just tell you about the assessment sites, they are going to have new hours going forward starting next week. They will be 10 to 3. The hope is that they will be more stable. We've been closing 
Well, OEM has been closing those if the temperature is below 35, and that will continue. Uh, but they are going to just close two of the three, and they will leave Nissan open, is my understanding. So, um, just so you're aware of that piece of information, vaccine-wise, uh, the very first thing I would say is a big shout out and thank you to Laura and all of the staff that has been working the the vaccination sites uh, and events. Um, we've had numerous. I can't tell you how many. Po very positive responses and uh, feedback we've gotten about the whole process that's very organized. We're not leaving people standing, waiting, uh, turning them away. Um, and so that is really all on Laura. She's done a great job with that. Um, currently, we are in 1A2, which is out uh, is office-based medical providers. Uh, we, to date, have received uh, the health department has 13,275 first doses of vaccine. Uh, we've given 7,328 7, first doses, and we have committed this next week uh, 2,300 doses for fixed and mobile events, another 1,200 for our 75 plus events, uh, and 1,500 for um, Harry, uh, who is working with their staff and students. Uh, unaffiliated medical providers and uh, are also going to be offering a 75 plus uh, event. Uh, we continue to hire nurses and other staffing working with community partners, uh, particularly Meharry, uh, also other health systems and uh, would be negligent if I didn't uh, thank HCA for uh, working with us to uh, get our first responders here in Nashville done. Uh, and they will start vaccinating uh, for their second vaccine next week. Um, so there's that. And uh, we also have made arrangements. This is Laura again. She made arrangements uh, and agreement with WeGo to assist anybody that has issues getting to a, a vaccine site. So we've been trying to think about uh, all of those issues that, that come up uh, in that regard. So... I'll turn this over then to Tina, and she can give her stuff. Hold on one second, please. Um, Dr. Wright, I have a couple questions with you before. So, Dr. Wright, I think you just mentioned WeGo in terms of uh, transit helping to get folks to vaccine, access to vaccine sites. I'm wondering about the transit workers themselves. If I remember correctly, Aren't they further down on the list when it comes to vaccination? Yes. And so if they're transporting individuals, is, does that put them at additional risk? And do we have an opportunity to get them vaccinated before they start transporting? We, we've had a discussion about that. And uh, uh, obviously, those people that are doing testing in our event sites uh, are doing vaccine in our event sites. Uh, that are exposed are being offered and and for those drivers that would be transporting uh, for this event only we would be offering them if they if they wish uh, the others go unfortunately we have to follow the state plan they've been moved down and at this point that would be where they're at but for those in particular I think it will help get volunteers to do it and it will help start to get into that population Okay, great, thank you. And, the, and my other question is around messaging and vaccine hesitancy. Um, in my nine to five, and involved in conversations around how to mess bring messages to the health department from the Ad Council, the Beaumont Foundation. How is Metro working with regard or, or ramping up with regards to messaging and, and what assistance do you need with getting messages out to the community? Right. So we have been working uh, with internal uh, and with Meharry. There is a uh, video that Dr. Hildreth has done. We used it internally for our first responders. Uh, and uh, don't know if it's been shared with you yet, but we did share it with uh, others. So that was one of the things, but we're working on a, I actually have a, a plan that we've uh, kind of got in place for vaccine uh, and that's part of it, but we're asking for some input from community uh, based groups and uh, I can talk with you about more about that offline. So 
specifically. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, uh, my question is probably maybe bigger than you can answer, but I have been getting some feedback from the community of people, even people who are sort of knowledgeable how to work the systems and that sort of thing, not being able to figure out where to go when the time for them comes. And I realize that there is very little national plan. There's a state plan. Is there a Davidson County plan? And if so, what role are we playing in that plan as far as how people know where to go get a vaccine and when to get it? And I realize it's a question of the country, but is there anything being done locally or is it all coming from the state? Well, we so far have been doing mostly closed pods, except for our 75 plus. Uh, closed pods being those that we're inviting people to. So that was initially the hospital systems, um, DIDD, uh, and some other things that we had responsibility to. We've now moved into those outpatient settings. We've been sending out uh, emails to based on the list of um, the, of licensed individuals within this within Davidson County, and that was provided from the state. So we're sending those out so that they can, we're directing them where to go uh, as far as signing up, and then when we're ready to and have vaccine form, we're letting them know uh, about that. As we get further down, it will be more. Uh, it will have to be more general, uh, and hopefully, then at that point. I'm hoping that it'll be widely available within the community. But the next group after this group is school teachers and daycares. And, and if I can add, a that, Dr. Wright, I, I yeah. want this group to be able to message. Metro Public Health is not the only entity giving vaccines. Yeah. That is so correct. I think it is critical to highlight um, health systems, um, including the mm -hmm. VA, by the way, which I think a lot of people don't think about. The VA is vaccinating. I know several people have gotten through there. Um, and, and just to elaborate on Dr. Wright, to the, the um, pod meeting, like first responders, so forth. Um, what I've been really proud of, and, and really, like I said, Laura and, and, and so forth have, have set forward is their, their appointment time, minimal ways, the social distancing. Um, and hopefully, as we, by the, hopefully in February, when more vaccine apparently will be available, uh, there are plans to go into much larger facilities. Um, that the city may run and partner with others. So just, yeah. just so you know. But I, and I thought that it may be your COVID task force and Metro may be the real yeah. driver and not not helping. Well, I would say, Dr. Wright, uh, we're all part of I mean, it. So, but there will be a, a bigger plan, all contingent on vaccine availability. So it's going to get much sloppier if it gets to the general public. Well, it is now. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, we're not, we're definitely not going to be able to give all the vaccines. So we're trying to leverage all of the community organizations and such that we can to be able to do that as we get increasing amounts of vaccine. Any other, any other I just want to say uh, two things really quickly. Um, probably everybody has, but I'm so glad to hear you've directly gotten lots of accolades. I've gotten calls at home who are from people who specifically said, that was the best experience I could have imagined, and it exceeded their expectations in terms of how it was done and, and the time factor and everything else. So congratulations to the entire team. And the other piece is that um, when and or if the time comes that we're <laughs> running out of trained vaccinators, uh, several people have said to me that retired nurses who have retained their license and who are very accustomed to giving injections are are ready at at, at the request to, yeah. to help out. And that maybe Tom and I just worked it. out to just worked out the ability to include them under our liability if if we use volunteers. So Fantastic. We're, we're we're planning on needing to use every resource within the community. So. Well, congratulations to you guys because you just um, outdone whatever any of us expected. It's just a, a really wonderful and, and, and something to be really proud of. Good job. You've done. If no more questions, I'm going to turn it over to Tina or to Brian. to Brian first, I guess. He's got something about messaging. About messaging so you can talk about that. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Tanae, for asking that. And I would like to have more conversation with you on any ideas that you have. I think what we're what we're doing is working as close as as closely as we can 
um, especially with, uh, I, and I think that uh, as I've heard, uh, the Meharry effort that really was announced today that their, all their slots are filled for Saturday. Hopefully for me, that's good news that, that the message is getting out, whether it's Dr. Hildreth uh, and some of our leaders that have said, look, I've gotten my shot and everybody should get theirs as well. Uh, but we're, we're so thankful to uh, Sharon Kay at WFSK and working with uh, Ernie Allen and others in the community that want to help us get the word out. And so we're going to work closely with them. I know Laura was on uh, with uh, Sharon Kay last night, um, but we're, we're looking for every opportunity to provide information, uh, especially those who are trusted uh, in the community to be able to push those messages out. And as Dr. Wright and, and Dr. Jahangir were saying, you know, as we, as we get more vaccine available to be able to do more, uh, even with like, for instance, being easier to access, like whether it's an MDHA high rise and be able to go to them with the message, but also with, with the vaccine. So I think we're, we're, we're also working closely with the mayor's office and some of their outreach to make that, uh, to get that message out. But I would love the opportunity to work with you on any, any recommendations you have and to be able to reach the community that we need to reach. Thank you, Brian. I'll make sure that we touch base. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. That was the director's update. <laughs> um, now I did um, put some information in the, um, the written update about the strategic plan and the accreditation plan. And um, we're on track to finish the uh, strategic plan possibly in April and the accreditation plan they're working on. We have till um, a, um, August to finish, but I think they are on track to try to finish by June. Um, I have Celia on the line if you have any specific questions about it, but we are meeting every other week, bi-weekly, and we're about halfway through um, the strategic plan. We did the SWOT analysis and um, set some priorities uh, this past Tuesday. We were we met for about four hours. So um, if you have any questions about the plan, I have Celia. Um, and the other part of the question uh, or the, the, um, the district, uh, the director's report was on data sharing. And um, there um, I have Rand Carpenter and Dr. Campbell, they've been working on that. And so um, if there's any updates from them, um, but I just gave you what Rand had um, sent in as a written um, update for the director's update. So if there's any questions about that. Are there any questions about the strategic planning accreditation process? Say that again. I, I, I was asking the board members if they have oh. questions. I'm good. Yeah. So, so you're, are you thinking that in April uh, you would uh, share a draft or something, ballpark or May? The or? strategic plan. Celia, uh, would we have a draft ready in April of the strategic plan? Uh, yes, we should have a draft of the actual document in April. Okay, okay great. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading it, but I wanted to double check that. Okay. Okay. All right, and any questions about data sharing, the data sharing? I do appreciate the update in the, in the right. report. Yeah. Okay. It seems straightforward. I don't have any questions. All right. And Dr. Campbell, is there anything that you want to update that you want to share specific, specifically about that? I have nothing to add at this point. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, it's in place and we're finally able to make it happen. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's my right. update. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tina. Okay. Uh, direct report of the chair. All right. 
All right. Uh, um, listen, my, my report is, is very somewhat simple. First and foremost, um, I didn't say at the beginning of this meeting, but it's way to now. It's thank you, um, Mr. Lester, Dr. Wright, for taking um, leadership role this past month. And thank everyone in, in this department for just, just kicking some rear. It's been a heck of a month. And, and I'm I am from, uh, I hate to call people out because there's so many people involved, but like, I, went, I came to one of the vaccination events this weekend. Uh, and, and, and I went to the East Clinic, um, the East, East National Clinic, and Laura and her team, and, and just and Tom, and just so many people I can, I just only want to start names because I hate to leave them out. But thank you, department, for everything you've done, and thank you, too, specifically for your leadership. It, it's, I'm, I just, I, I can't overemphasize this. This has been a really, it's really exciting work we're doing. We're at a exciting phase in, in the COVID response when it comes to vaccinations, and I assure everyone listening that, that we're trying to be as diligent and to, to get this out as quickly as possible in a, an equitable and a safe and a um, user-friendly manner. And so this is referring to the vaccine. So I feel hope and optimism that we are we are heading the right way and hopefully within the next, gosh knows how many, many more months, and I think that is the right way, as many more months it will be done. So. That's, that's my um, real big report. I think you guys hear me talk a lot daily on other stuff. So I don't need to give every information out there, but, but I do feel optimistic about our vaccine distribution plan, our testing plan, um, and where we're heading with, with the leadership, um, <clears throat> Dr. Wright and Ms. Lester. And um, I, I don't, as we talked about, let's get COVID done before we start talking about any, um, any future um, Search for a full-time director. So just just so you all know, that's kind of my that's all I got to say. Yes. Sir. You for remembering the board and such measures. Yeah. And and I think that's that's all right. Um, thank you all for remembering us. Yes. It's, I I I was very kind of you all. Very grateful. Um. So that that's my report. Um. Not a not a fancy. You guys said you guys have some great work. <laughs> um. With that being said, um, uh, review of board requests. So I don't think we we had we had any per se. Okay. Um, so with that said, unless there's any objections, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Great. I'm going to open up the civil service board, uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Dr. Shahangir. The only uh, item on the agenda for the civil service board is the personnel changes from December. Uh, they were included in the advance packet, and I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone had with those. Any. Questions, thoughts? Okay. Hearing none, thank you for that. All right. Civil Service Board is adjourned. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of January. See you next month. Thank you. Bye. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.